when I realized that war really was going to, you know, happen, I tried to, and he'd left, like the other Igbo that fled to the east, where they were more secure. Chinua Achebe was in the east. Uh, we had other writers like uh, Gabriel Okara in the east. And I felt maybe by linking up and resurrecting that tight uh, uh, community, we could, we might be able to do something uh, to prevent that war. And so I traveled, by then the firing had started, the early skirmishes had begun. And I traveled to, by road to the east. Uh, I was promptly arrested as a suspected enemy by the, by the BFMs who might come to see. But of course, you know, the, some time after the police realized who I was and I was released. And who would come into my police station? He didn't know I was there. It was Christopher Kibu coming from the war front, you know, coming for more equipment. And so we were reunited for the last time. Okay, he went back to the war front and I saw the uh, leader of the secessionist enclave, a Juku, we spoke, and, that's, and then when I came back, I was detained for having traveled uh, to the east. I was accused of all kinds of things, including trying to buy jet fighters for the, I don't know why people uh, <laughs> like to cook, you know, fantasies around, you know, uh, around one's individual existence. This talk was recorded by Professor Wale Shoyinka at the British Library in October 2015. Professor Shoyinka is a distinguished Nigerian playwright, novelist, poet, academic and commentator. In 1986, he became the first African to win the Nobel Prize in Literature. His works tackle key issues for colonial and modern Africa while drawing on a deep and complex African cultural heritage. Throughout his career, Shoyinka has been an outspoken critic of injustice and corruption, and he spent time in prison in Nigeria during the 1960s. The talk has the rather mysterious title, West African Road Relief, The Open Galleries, and Shoyinka approaches his subject in a playfully cryptic way. What he's talking about is the public art seen everywhere across West Africa and in other parts of Africa too. Streets, marketplaces, gathering places, buildings are all shaped by a very particular visual culture far from the corporate images that dominate Western public spaces. In Africa, public places are crowded with multiple artistic visions and verbal contributions with a strong sense of individual authorship and creativity. From the work of the professional artist to signboards written by bus and lorry drivers. This visual culture is composed of, for example, murals, art for sale, textiles bearing many types of meaning. But here, Shoinka is talking especially about the decoration of vehicles, minibuses, lorries, taxis. These are all conveyances for hire in one way or another, and they are in the hands of people who earn their living from driving and take pride in communicating their beliefs and knowledge through their choice of sayings and slogans for public display. In the talk, Professor Shoinka also references the African Union. This body, which was founded as the Organization of African Unity, is an international association promoting cooperation among Africa's nations. Shoinka juxtaposes the power of presidents with the word from the street. This, the word from the street, is, he suggests, a strong expression of democracy, a democratic instinct deeply embedded within African history and society. Slogans and sayings seen on buses and taxis, such as, no condition is permanent, and the big leaf shall not crush the smaller, challenge the hubris of the powerful in Africa and elsewhere. This particular kind of art which I have in mind, I sometimes call mobile murals. Uh, here's what I have to say about them uh, periodically. And uh, most of us here would have seen those, no, not most, some, would have seen those murals. Uh, assume that uh, you've never been knocked down by one of them, or you wouldn't be here listening to me today. Uh, the kind of mural um, I have in mind exists also abundantly in Latin America. 
often brash, crude, exhibiting an untutored draftsmanship, displaying bizarre color combinations, then nonetheless statements of great political astuteness, pithy comments on day-to-day -day realities as well as aspirations. It gave me much pleasure some years ago to propose some of these inscriptions, these panel inscriptions, during an address in Addis Ababa uh, as ideal logo or motto for those charged with establishing modalities for the creation of the Africa Union. The reasoning was this. The Africa Union is intended to be a replacement of the ancient uh, rickety political conveyance uh, on which Africans have traveled ever since independence. Would the new conveyance be an improvement? At least the mobile murals to which I refer, and surely by now some of you would have guessed the kind of peripatetic art I'm talking about. Those conveyances at least get you somewhere. Well, it's an hour later, that is. I'm not the first, by the way, to have remarked the trenchant politics of those popular art forms, however. The Ghanaian novelist Aikweama constructed his scatological narrative titled The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born around uh, one of these famous inscriptions which he took from a Troto uh, lorry. Those who read the novel or simply traveled on West African roads will certainly have deduced from that final comment the kind of uh, mobile mural that constitutes my affection. Aikoyama's title was taken from one of them, locally built transport known in Ghana as the Trotro, or in Nigeria as the Mami Wagon, Bole Kaja, Danfo, etc., etc. Inscriptions that have formed the subject of quite a few monograms and monographs, um, coffee table publications. The inscriptions on these trucks, better known as lorries in local language, are often taken from proverbs, expressions of traditional wisdoms, sound bites from the most unlikely sources, wrenched from their original contexts, which may vary from Shakespeare, a favorite is Julius Caesar, you know, and uh, especially that uh, section, the evil that men do, to passages in the Bible, Quran, not omitting dialogue from uh, Indian uh, films, westerns, and even Kung Fu narratives. The Quranic inscriptions appear in Arabic, and you can tell that the Arabic script is a favorite for some, not only for what it actually says, but for the attraction of its calligraphy, which is then subjected to real marvelous adumbrations. But it doesn't matter the language of expression. Ever, tree, Yoruba, Igbo, Hausa, etc., etc. The calligraphy, the sumptuous attention to the inscription, usually in every incompatible color of the spectrum, is literally a blinding piece of art. The more complex statements attain artistic eloquence through companion illustrations in the text, sometimes embedded, sometimes just uh, acting as a frame, sometimes just written, scrawled right across the picture so that even the illiterate will understand what the textual reference is about. This eclectic appropriation of shorthand quotations and aphorisms for contemporary realities, anxieties, aspirations, and even as a shorthand record of momentous events is very much a feature of popular culture that extends even beyond the mobile murals. From religious mythology <clears throat> comes a favorite and eloquent one, the painting of David routing Goliath in single combat with reinforcing inscription, Ewenla Kuniruwewe, which translates as, the big leaf shall not crush the smaller. Not much comment is necessary to grasp its sociopolitical message. The championship of the little man, the powerless citizen, against the more powerful. The idioms of action in some of these paintings are as fascinating as they are unpredictable. These are 
the artists of the modern world. So don't look out for a David armed with a slingshot. No, you're more likely to encounter our diminutive champion directing a Bruce Lee flying karate kick at the neck of Goliath with that unfortunate giant buckling at the knees, staggering backwards. That's one of my favorites. This mural art of social commentary extends into the world of song, lyrics, and needless to say, popular theater. It functions in the same way as the works of the more so-called sophisticated writers who operate in modern modes of expression or adaptations of the old. I've always considered them statements beyond the mere art of the mural, however, and tend to view them as instructional, open-air panels on socio-political ethics. That was why, in my address in Addis, I also proposed a compulsory exercise for African leaders, which should take the form of a staggered ride through the length and breadth of the country over which they exercise power, in one of those mummy wagons with a booklet of the inscriptions in their hand, and preferably that they change conveyances every 10 kilometers or so. Not only would they have, I swore, a very real lesson in how the other side lives, they might even begin to understand how these crude inscriptional artworks are the very definition of the existential reality and worldviews of their neglected companions in the rickety and tumultuous, often fatal contraptions. They would experience the environment over which they preside as the other side does, with all the bombs, corrugations, filth, edge of survival, commerce, raucousness, uncertainties, real-time tragedies, and petty triumphs. But above all, a resilience that is often the sole surviving element of society itself appears to collapse around them. In short, they would experience not only how the other side lives, but how they die. Sample a few of these inscriptions. No telephone line to heaven. Chop small, no quench. Or its extension, chop small, quench small, chop big, quench big. Extended so as to leave no shred of ambiguity in the mind of the slow-witted. And there is the fervent prayer and summons to the responsibility of elders, another one, one that might have a special resonance for the European and American green campaigners for clean air and protection of the ozone layer. This goes, the young shall grow. The context, of course, is different at source, but it's a direct admonition to the first comers in the stakes of social status and economic wealth to remember that there are generations after them who also deserve their own place in the sun. We see, however, how this can be extended to the global concern for preserving the planet as a space of survival for coming generations. Let me just uh, add one more of my favorites, which will not surprise anyone. No condition is permanent. With the other, the first one, which I mentioned, the big leaf shall not crush the smaller, they form the two of my favorite of the hundreds that I've ever seen. They actually vie for primacy, I think, in uh, my social choices. And I also offered them, the leaders in Addis Ababa, a choice between these various uh, inscriptions, especially those of them who insist for instance, that uh, I'm talking about the dictators, who love to insist that democracy is an alien, alien concept to Africans. Well, I think most of my own school of thinking will disagree. In fact, I consider it one of the most uh, intolerable political blasphemies ever uttered by anyone. And you can try an experiment, you know, debate uh, democracy any way you like, mystify it, reify it. But make a simple test. Take a few Africans, uh, especially West Africans, uh, peasants, factory workers, motor uh, highway drivers, etc., etc. Take them to a motor park. Place a hundred lorries with all the various panels with these numerous inscriptions 
and ask which of them actually spells and defines democracy. And unerringly, I bet you they will point out no condition is permanent.